episode 176 of Futures Radio Show, sponsored by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Com. Every day, traders and investors dive in to tackle the ever-changing markets to find opportunity. Futures Radio Show is your number one source for answers to the questions that all market participants want to ask. Veteran futures trader Anthony Crudelli sits down with the most influential leaders and top traders in the industry. Now, here's your host, Anthony Crudelli. Hey, everyone. Before we get started today, I want to thank our sponsors. CME Group, Trading Technologies, RJO Futures, and Top Step Trader. Now today I spoke with Jack Tater, co-author of Crypto Assets and Managing Partner at Doyle Capital. Jack's book has been instrumental in my learning about crypto assets. And today Jack and I began our conversation by talking about the basics of Bitcoin and other crypto assets. The day we recorded this show was the same day that Jamie Dimon said he regretted calling Bitcoin a fraud, and I asked Jack to respond to his comments. We chatted about the difference between trading crypto assets versus investing in crypto assets. Jack explains why there is a limited amount of Bitcoin and tells investors how they can value Bitcoin and other crypto assets. Finally, we chatted about additional investment vehicles to invest in cryptos, and he tells us what he thinks of ICOs and what crypto assets Jack's keeping an eye on. As usual, thank you all for listening, and please enjoy this episode. Jack, welcome to the show. Anthony, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. No, it's great to have you on the show today, Jack. A lot to talk about today. We have some headlines this morning that you and I are going to discuss as well. But I want to begin by getting your backstory. I read your book. I loved it. It was fantastic. It's the book I recommend for everybody to read uh, when they're starting to learn about crypto assets. So I really want to get your backstory out of the gates here. So can you tell us how you got your start in the industry and then talk to us about how you ended up getting involved in crypto assets? Sure, sure. Well, I'm I'm not your typical uh, the, the typical person that you'd see at a lot of these Bitcoin and, and crypto assets events. I'm uh, uh, I'm much closer to retirement than to just starting work than most of the people there. So I've actually been involved on on Wall Street and worked for financial services for almost three decades, and worked as a financial advisor, and uh, had been very much involved with retirement planning, and was writing a column for Market Watch. And had written a couple of books on retirement. It was really a focus of mine and, and retirement planning. And I also run a, a market research company. And there was a point in time where I had a client who asked about Bitcoin. And wasn't something we were familiar with. This is back in, in 2012. Wasn't something we were familiar with. So so my uh, my associate and I decided, all right, let's 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 take a look at this and let's provide a report here. Well, my associate, who was a young young gentleman... He came back to me with about a 60 page report on Bitcoin and I was just fascinated by it. And he and I sat down and we ended up writing what, what came out to be what's the deal with Bitcoins. And uh, we published the book. Uh, it was, you know, uh, not, not a huge success, but it really got us involved in in looking at this. And I've always been involved in new technologies or whatnot. And then in 2013, I started to think about, well, how can I incorporate Bitcoin into retirement planning. I just, you know, they seem to be oil and oil and water there. But, but I started to uh, take a look at that, started to research it, and started to write about it. And I wrote a series of, of uh, articles on Market Watch about investing in Bitcoin and crypto assets, well, specifically Bitcoin, and putting it into my retirement account. And there was a series of articles that were published about it. And basically, I tried to integrate what I knew about financial planning with the technology, with really what I thought the long-term prospects for Bitcoin were. And that's how I kind of got my, my, uh, my thoughts around 
not just what Bitcoin was, but also around it as an investment. And from there, that led me to getting involved with the community. Uh, I've been to probably just about every uh, Bitcoin conference there is internationally. Uh, got me involved with Chris, who is my co-author of the book, who's 30 years younger than me. Um, and it's just a fascinating world. And and it's a world that I think I really wish more people were aware of because it really there is a real there's a lot of innovation, a lot of exciting things that are going on in this world. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Jack. I mean, one of the main reasons I brought you on the show today was to bring awareness as to what crypto assets are to traders and investors out there because I think that so many of them are sitting on the sidelines, not yet trading or investing into these crypto assets. And after reading your book, I really had such a better idea uh, about these crypto assets. And one of the basic things I learned was that the lowercase b, when someone talks about Bitcoin, it is referring to the cryptocurrency. And when someone's using a capital B, when they're talking about Bitcoin, that's the software. And just these basic things about Bitcoin and crypto assets, uh, you do such a great job, you and Chris, in your book and explaining. But uh, right now, I'd like for you to, if you could, please just give us a basic explanation as to what Bitcoin is and also explain to everybody why they're called cryptocurrencies, because I think a lot of people don't know why they're called cryptos. Sure, sure. Well, this is this is a very it's very interesting when we really started to look at Bitcoin and at its simplest form. Uh, Bitcoin is software. Bitcoin began as software that is running on people's computers uh, basically throughout the world. And the software, the concept of Bitcoin was written by a, uh, an entity. We don't know who the person is. We don't know if it's one person, a couple of people uh, named Satoshi Nakamoto. And basically, it is an amazing concept. It essentially, uh, and what we also learned is that it grew out of the financial crisis. It was, uh, it was presented to the world right in the middle of the financial crisis of 2008, which really leads us to believe that there was a lot of thinking that went into wanting to create a new monetary system or a new system that worked better than the current existing financial uh, uh, model. So I think that's an interesting point there as well. But what essentially what Bitcoin is, is it's a distributed network of computers uh, running the software. That's the blockchain. All of these computers are connected because they're running the software on their computers. So they're running the software on their computer they're all connected. It's distributed. There is no central authority. And what ends up happening is, let's say that I want to send you a transaction, a transaction being Bitcoin. Okay. If I want to send you a Bitcoin, I do that transaction. And then there are people on the network who then compete for uh, a reward of Bitcoin for, for doing that, for verifying that transaction. That transaction is verified. It's written permanently onto the ledger of the blockchain, which is which is the underlying infrastructure of Bitcoin, the blockchain. And the blockchain is all those computers connected together. So you're rewarded with that. And the reason that you're rewarded with Bitcoin, this is something I think people don't realize, is is to to for the health of the ecosystem. Because this is a distributed network, there's no central authority. Anybody can get onto this network or years ago, anyone could get onto it and run the software. Um, and in that way, you could be rewarded with Bitcoin. So it keeps the ecosystem running. It keeps it healthy and you earn a Bitcoin for that. What's what's so that's what Bitcoin is. It was really a reward system for running this this software. It's then turned into currency because people in the early days were using it as a way to pay for things, barter for things. And it does have all the workings of a currency, albeit there are some shortcomings with it that are being that are being addressed these days. So so the capital B of it is really the platform of the Bitcoin blockchain. So the capital B Bitcoin is the platform. The currency that is created there or that people are rewarded with is the small B Bitcoin. So that's the difference between Bitcoin and the capital and the smaller B. And that's in, in its simplest form, that's what Bitcoin is. I think it's important, and, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about the blockchain, but it's important to recognize that that the invention here of this was so key because of the blockchain creation. And the blockchain has so many uses. It has such an efficient uh, system of 
of creating permanent, immutable uh, transactions, but also it's very transparent. People don't realize that this is one of the most transparent systems out there because every computer has the up-to-date ledger. So you can go onto this ledger and you can see transactions that were made two, three, four years ago uh, because it's all permanently embedded. So, so the ability to see transparency there uh, on the blockchain is is a huge aspect of it. What's the reason that they're called crypto assets? And um, and I know this is kind of a term. And in fact, we even talk about it in the book where it's kind of a term that uh, makes people shudder because it's you know you call a book crypto assets. Maybe you're not thinking it's you're not the marketing guys might be shaking their heads and wondering what how did you use this name? But it's basically tipping the hat to the technology of cryptography. And cryptography is basically the science of securely transmitting data so that only the intended recipient can receive it, kind of a handshake. And there are a private key and a public key associated with people's transactions on, on the Bitcoin network. Everyone can see your public key, but the private key is something that you control, that you maintain yourself. So cryptography is really, and I, I can, you know, we could spend days talking about the underlying technology, but it's really the way that uh, assets get sent to the right person securely. And the secure aspect of this is why it's, it's referred to as crypto, crypt, crypto, because it's, once again, it's using that term cryptography, which was, um, which was something that was used to uh, protect data, protect numbers, all of those types of things. So, so it is a scary term, but it really, the underlying aspect of this is that there is security and there is technology behind all of these transactions and the intent there is to really make sure the right person's getting it and it's done in a very secure manner. And accordingly, people have talked about hacks involving uh, uh, Bitcoin. The reality is that the blockchain has never been hacked. Uh, and, and a lot of this is because of the structure of cryptography. So the blockchain and Bitcoin have never been hacked. What have been hacked are exchanges where where Bitcoin is held. And that's and that just shows the shortcoming of some of those exchanges, but it also shows the the solidness of the of the Bitcoin blockchain and the cryptography that's used there. Thank you so much for that explanation, Jack. I really appreciate it. I think it's very important even for those that know what Bitcoin is uh, to hear it and to be reminded of what Bitcoin is. Now, today we're going to talk a lot about the lowercase b, Jack, uh, the currency. This is a trading show. We're going to talk about trading and investing in Bitcoin. And at the beginning of the show, I mentioned there was some news breaking today. And that news that broke today was Jamie Dimon coming out and saying that he regrets calling Bitcoin a fraud. And I only mention that because you have had a problem with Jamie Dimon saying that. So I'm going to let you respond uh, to that news. And also, if you could, Jack, tell us how Bitcoin can be an investment. Well, when you've been involved with Bitcoin since I have, which is 20, 2013, which doesn't seem like a long time, but it's it's really long in terms of Bitcoin. And there are other people who have been involved in it for, for a lot longer. I've seen Bitcoin go up and down. I've seen Bitcoin get written about and I've seen Bitcoin get get uh, dismissed so many times and and you know it'll drop 40%. People say it's the death of Bitcoin, it's over, it's it's tulips, it's a Ponzi scheme, all of these types of things. And it just shows it's an uneducated response to the technology there. So when a person like Jamie Dimon, who obviously gets a platform like he does, comes out and calls it a fraud. It's not only uneducated and, and incorrect, but it's it's and and it's and you almost have to look beyond the blatant aspect of him trying to obviously protect the status quo. I mean, here's a guy, he you know he runs a major bank, you know he would be his whole business model would be disrupted by something like Bitcoin. So he has to dismiss it. The problem is, the problem is he also has the ear of investors out there. And by telling investors, and let's think about this now. Now he's saying he regrets this, but for years, he he kept investors away from this. He kept people away from making money and profiting from this because of his uneducated and and wrongheaded comments about it being a fraud. Now he says he's sorry. And I think this is a problem with a lot of what's going on in the financial services area because they, they don't understand this. They haven't figured out how to make money from it. They're challenged by that because they're part of the status quo. They're challenged by it. 
So they dismiss it. They dismiss it as a fraud, and they say Ponzi schemes and tulips. And it's blatantly incorrect. If you educate yourself and take a look at it, you'll 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 understand that it is not like that. And obviously, it's still standing. It's thriving, even after it's been beat up and criticized by so many people. So so when Jamie Dimon and the financial service companies say this, they're keeping people away from investing in this. And I think a lot of it is, like you said, like I said, they don't understand it as an investment. So let's take a look at why I think it's an investment. The reality is, is uh, after this Bitcoin blockchain was built and people were transferring Bitcoin back and forth to each other, uh, there was the thought that let's try and tie this to fiat currency. So is Bitcoin worth a penny? Is it worth a dollar or whatever? So the way you do that as a way you do it with capitalism is put it out there to market dynamics. So exchanges started to open up that basically said, we'll now trade Bitcoin. So you tell us what you're willing to pay for it. And so once it went on to exchanges, one of the first exchanges was Mt. Gox, which is a, uh, which was something that got hacked and, and people got their assets stolen and something that people point to as a reason not to get involved with it. Um, but we now see many other exchanges out there. But once that happened, then it really became an investment because people were willing to convert this over to dollars and to buy and sell it amongst each other. And then there's also the aspect of really what is an asset as well. And, you know, an asset is something that, um, where, you know, there has to be some reasonable value to it. So there has to be some valuation. Now, granted, valuing Bitcoin is not the easiest thing in the world, but we do talk about some valuation methods in the book. And I think there are ways that you can take a look at it. For instance, many people have looked at Bitcoin as a store of value. Uh, similar to gold. And so if Bitcoin was able to maybe take even 5% of the market of gold as a store of value, that 5% would equate to a certain value within Bitcoin because there are only going to be 21 million Bitcoin ever created. So, so because of that, there is a way to create some valuation. So it can be valued uh, and also you can consume it. What we're finding is that Bitcoin can be used as a currency, uh, you know, albeit it may not be the greatest thing for um, for buying coffee with. But you can do that. It can be used as a currency. So there's all these different aspects to it. It's it, there's a huge remittance market opportunity for it where people can can do cross-border transactions much cheaper than they can do with a western union or credit cards that's a huge opportunity and if that opportunity is realized the valuation of bitcoin will increase so i would i talk in the book and I, I know you and i've discussed this i i talk in the book about how any asset has speculative value and utility value uh, and a lot of times when something comes out, the, specula the speculative value is very high until the utility catches up. And if there is no utility value, the, the speculative value will drop and maybe the asset goes away, which we saw during the dot-com era. But what we're seeing with Bitcoin is we're seeing that there is utility in this coin. So the speculative value went up, but also the utility went up. People are using it for transactions. People are using it as a store of value. The remittance market is starting to use it. Other countries are using it. We're starting to see it um, used on exchanges. So now all of a sudden there's a utility value to it. So it's clear to me that it's an asset. Now, is it an asset similar to to equities and uh, bonds and those types of things. Well, that's where you have to start taking a look at uh, the classes of those assets. And, and uh, that's where I start to then pull in a lot of my analysis of asset allocation, modern portfolio theory, to really, if Bitcoin is an asset, what type of asset is it and how do you fit it into your portfolio? Okay, a couple of questions. The first sure. one I have is, you mentioned that there's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin. Is there a mathematical reason why that is? Um, there is. There is. There is a mathematical reason for it. And like I said, I'm more, in a, more of an investor <coughs> than a technology guy. But there is a specific reason for that uh, because built into the system is the need to have this. The last Bitcoin will be created about 100 years from now. And um, and it, the, it's extended out that that long to keep the ecosystem running. OK, if you gave everyone 21 million Bitcoin right off the bat, 
um, then basically there would be no incentive for people to keeping the ecosystem up and running because there'd be no reward system. So the software is built to extend this over a period of time. And what's actually happened is that there are what are known as halfings. So, so five years ago, you might have received 20 bitcoins uh, for uh, validating a transaction. Then there's a halving. So now you receive 10 bitcoins and then there's another halving and you receive five bitcoins. Those halvings and those um, parameters are set up to extend out the ability for Bitcoin to be created, uh, all the Bitcoin to be in the market a hundred years from now. And that's to keep the ecosystem running. So there, there, I mean, we can go into the, the specifics of that. I don't think we want to go into the, the time aspect of, of, of evaluating that. And probably I'm not the smartest guy around that as well. But uh, what's what's important to to recognize here is that there is a finite supply that is out there, which basically means that it's a dis, dis, disinflationary asset, unlike gold, where you can keep pulling up as much gold as you want out of the ground. Uh, so there is that there is that set amount that's that's there, uh, and like I said, a lot a lot of that amount is because of the structure of the halving and and everything else. The other thing I think that's that's interesting here too, is that the creator of Bitcoin also recognized that if you threw a lot of computer power at this, maybe you can get more Bitcoin than someone else. So what's interesting is in the software, it ad automatically adjusts to the computer power that's out there on the network, and it increases the difficulty of earning uh, a Bitcoin. And, and that's to thwart anyone from owning 51% of Bitcoin, to keep this in a very distributed manner and so that no one holds a majority of all the Bitcoin or mines for a majority of the Bitcoin. So like I said, it's a fascinating software um, design that was created here uh, to basically keep it running in a distributed and decentralized manner. Next, I want to move on and talk about trading Bitcoin versus investing in it. Now, Jack, you've mentioned a lot today about investing in Bitcoin. And as a trader, I love the volatility. And to me, where Bitcoin is trading in terms of price doesn't really matter because I'm in and out of the market all the time. So the more volatile, the better. But investors have a different mindset. And I don't know that they can stomach this type of volatility. And they really don't know how to value it. So how do you get someone to come in and buy something that's at seventeen, eighteen thousand now when just a couple of months ago it was at ten thousand? Uh, you know, I, I, to me, that's a hard pill to swallow for an investor. So, how do you evaluate Bitcoin as an investment when there are no fundamentals? I mean, maybe you, you proved to me wrong, and there are fundamentals uh, versus just a, a trading instrument. Well, it's uh, it's it's tough, but it's not impossible. And my co-author, Chris Berniski, I think is one of the leading people with, with addressing this whole point of valuation and how do you value these assets. So, And he's done a lot of work, but uh, he'll be the first to admit, and I agree with him, that a lot of this is just laying down the foundation for future work and people taking a look at this. Now, that being said, as I mentioned before, I think there are some ways to, to look at Bitcoin on a valuation method. So... Uh, if Bitcoin is something that can be used for currency transactions, if it's something that can be used as a store of value, you can start to speculate that, okay, if, if as I mentioned before, if people decided that Bitcoin could be a store of value similar to gold and people started to invest and use Bitcoin in a similar manner to the way that they use gold. Obviously, you can't make necklaces and things out of Bitcoin, but it can be a store of value. It can be something that's, that's referenced as value, and we're seeing that with a lot of these other crypto assets. If, if it can take a small percentage of the market away from gold and put it into Bitcoin, there's a valuation there. For instance, I mentioned remittances before. Okay, so if remittances, and remittances are one of the major use cases that are seen with, with Bitcoin because the transaction fees are low and the ability for people to send assets cross-border, you, you don't have to exchange into the different fiats, it can go directly. So, I mean, people right now want to send money to Mexico, they get hit for a 10% 10 charge from Western Union. 
you want to send it in Bitcoin, it's maybe up to uh, less than 1% of that. So obviously more money can go there. So it's a compelling use case for remittances. So let's say that if Bitcoin was to get just 1% of the global remittance market, and then you start to take a look at the velocity of Bitcoin and all those types of things. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the market there for uh, remittances is about $436 billion. So if Bitcoin can get 1% of that, or 10% of that market, then it starts to have a valuation. And, and these valuations, um, you can add to each other. So if there's a valuation for, for it as replacing the gold market, that gets added to the uh, valuation of it um, as, as, as a solution in the remittance market, and so on and so forth. And, and could it be a currency that people are going to use? So there are th- ways to value this. Now, th- then you can start to take a look at the, the size of the asset base, uh, the uh, velocity of how these, these uh, coins are being used, and all of these types of things. And you can come up with some, with some valuation pertaining to this. I talked before, uh, and I think the simplest, the simplest thing to take a look at is speculative value and utility value. And obviously, there's a lot of speculative value built into a lot of these crypto assets. But at some point in time, the utility value of these coins start to be realized. Maybe we're seeing that with something like Ripple, where where Ripple is starting to be seen as a way to do money transfers, and there's a real utility value to that coin. Well, now there's a utility value there, and that utility value is increasing and potentially the speculative value. Now, once again, it's not as black and white as with other assets where you have discounted cash flow and all of these other types of things. Um, so, so you have to kind of take some leaps of faith here with it. Uh, but I also think as a trader, you said you were a trader, I also think there is a very interesting way to look at this from a technical analysis standpoint. And, and if you start to take a look at a lot of these assets, the rules of technical analysis start to play into them as well. So I think those two aspects, fundamental analysis and technical analysis, always have to be used with any asset, but they can be used here with Bitcoin. But I do agree that we're at the early stages of the valuation of crypto assets, but there are models being put together to ground this in a valuation concept and evaluation method that are being worked on. So you mentioned Bitcoin can be valued in some ways. So what do you think of the price of Bitcoin now? I mean, we've been sitting between what, 15 and 20,000 over the past few weeks. And do you think we're too high? You think we're too low? Are you surprised to see us up here? What do you think about the price of Bitcoin? Well, I'm I'm a bit surprised that it's here. I had, uh, uh, and I'm not the type to really predict or make um, predict uh, forecasts, but I had said at a conference last year that I expected 20k by the year 2020. Um, we're just about there. I think we're we're very much uh, ahead of things. But I also think that a big part of this is the fact that that people are using this and they're finding utility value uh, in this in this um, uh, asset. Uh, so I, I think it's a, it is a little bit ahead of itself. However, that being said, that being said, what we're also finding is that Bitcoin is has a utility uh, and it's being utilized as a platform to improve itself. And what do I mean by that? So a couple of months ago, there was a uh, real evaluation that, look, Bitcoin transactions are taking too long. It really can't be a valid currency until it it, it speeds up its transactions and uh, uh, lowers its cost of transaction. So built off of that, um, that platform was something called uh, Bitcoin Cash, which is a fork off of Bitcoin. When that fork happened, Every holder of Bitcoin got one Bitcoin, had their own Bitcoin, but they also got almost like a dividend of Bitcoin Cash. And that Bitcoin Cash was a new asset that actually is is a faster uh, faster transaction speeds, uh, cheaper transaction speeds, and the thought was this could be used as more of a currency. So people got that. That coin was worth two thousand. Is now worth about two thousand dollars. So you had you had your Bitcoin and you also got this other coin there as well. So people are starting to see 
Bitcoin as a platform for development. Uh, and, and additionally, we're seeing that with Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum is, is, is another coin that's out there. It's a bit, it's different from, uh, from Bitcoin, but it's a platform that's being used to develop other applications on. As more people start to use Ethereum to build applications on it, we've seen the value of Ethereum go up. And Ethereum is now over $1,000 a coin. And the reason for that is because people are finding utility value in Ethereum to develop applications for everything from uh, from uh doing keeping track of title insurance insurance applications uh, a lot of different applications are being built prediction models are being built on the ethereum platform so so we're starting to recognize the utility value there and the price is rising accordingly so uh, when you start to take a look at those replacement values for bitcoin to replace gold replace remittance markets but also as a platform to grow other applications that's where we're really starting to see the value uh, of of uh, Bitcoin increase. I mean, I've seen people say, "Look, you know, it's going to go up to fifty thousand dollars by the end of the year," and they and they say because of the different applications there, they say because of the uh, percentage of the market and remittances that it's going to take, the percentage of transaction volume it's going to have, and all of those types of things. That's where they forecast this this type of thing out. You know, we're in we're in a marketplace where we don't have the luxury of a lot of past data to evaluate this. So many of these things are a leap of faith. But as I say, there there is a lot going on here. There's a lot of ways to kind of spitball this, so to speak, in terms of valuation. Uh, and I think we'll start to get to some mechanisms that'll put this back into a much uh, more formalized valuation method, uh, probably a number of years from now. I want to talk a little bit about the ease of getting into buying these crypto assets. Uh, I have to say, at first, it was tough for me to even figure it out. I had to call a friend who helped me figure out how to get the, the Coinbase account and then use Coinigy for charts and then getting GDAX, which is the same company as Coinbase. They really don't make that too transparent. Uh, you know, you're going in and it's something that should take you 15 minutes to open up an account is in taking you much longer than that. I mean, for example, I was by my one friend's house the other day. He couldn't even... Uh, get the account open. I was trying to help him get the license situated on the camera to get it to get it open. It just it wasn't happening. So for those people that were unable to get uh, their accounts open and maybe are looking for other ways uh, to invest in these uh, crypto assets, what other investment vehicles are currently available besides futures, which we know we have uh, Bitcoin futures now at CME Group? And what do you think will soon be available to investors? Well, without a doubt, we have to make this easier for people to invest in. Because I will tell you, and I've been involved in investing in this, it's a lot of work. And it's a lot of work because you have you have the major assets like uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, Litecoin. They're traded on some of the larger exchanges like a Coinbase. But then there are over a thousand other crypto assets and sometimes if you want to buy those crypto assets, you have to go to some esoteric exchange. Yeah. You don't even know where it is uh, and, and buy it and sell it and do all those types of things. So I think there's a huge opportunity for someone to come along and make this more user friendly. That being said, I, I think it's I think it's great that uh, we're starting to see more investment vehicles for the typical investor come along. Um, the fact that you can trade futures on the CME, I think, is is a is a great way to kind of get started here for the individual investor because the, uh, the the point is is that it's not easy for people to invest in this and I do believe this can be viewed as an alternative asset for people's portfolios small amounts in their portfolios and viewed from the aspect of asset allocation so how do you how do you put that into your portfolio it's not easy there there's one kind of pseudo ETF that's out there called GBTC which trades at a huge premium it's not really a specifically an ETF but it's the closest thing to it we're going to need to see and I think we will see ETFs come along in the marketplace over the next couple of years that will make it easy for people who want to put this uh, asset into their portfolio. Probably you'll see a Bitcoin ETF come along first. Then you'll see perhaps an Ether 
uh, ETF. And then I think you're going to see multi uh, crypto, multi crypto uh, portfolios come out, something that may have uh, Ripple in it, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, something that's diversified out there to give you more of a play within the crypto asset market, and whether that's a mutual fund or an ETF. I think you're going to see that because the reality is right now, an accredited investor uh, a high net worth person can go and they can invest money right now with hedge funds uh, and and venture capital firms and 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 investment groups out there to get some real play uh, in this marketplace. But for the typical investor who could really benefit by having this in a small, as I mentioned, alternative asset in their portfolio, we've got to make it easier for them. And I think you're going to start to see that. I think the fact even with Jamie Dimon saying it's no longer fraud, I I, I don't doubt that Chase and the other firms are starting to realize how they can make money off of this and they'll start coming up with investment vehicles. And I know there's a number in the pipeline already. So I think you're going to start to see that. Once you see that, that again adds value to the underlying asset. But even more importantly, uh, you're going to bring a lot of smart people, a lot of smart analysts who are going to come in and they're going to create valuation methods for uh, for these assets uh, they're going to be much further along than anything that Chris and I have worked on uh, that are going to really put uh, some valuation to these assets and really help investors to understand the value and the potential for these types of assets. So far today, we've mentioned Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, and maybe even Litecoin. Those are the four majors that are talked about the most. Now, Jack, besides those four majors, what other crypto assets are you interested in? I don't want to get into the <clears throat> position of of uh, recommendations, but I think what what people should be looking at who are looking at the space. And I mentioned before, there's over a thousand assets in this space, and we haven't even touched on the whole ICO initial coin offering aspect of this, which is a way to create new coins and new companies. Uh, but I think what people can look at is that there are different crypto assets that do different things. For instance, there may be a group of assets <clears throat> that are more uh, privacy based, more anonymous based. There are assets called Monero, Dash, Zcash that are working on doing transactions in a much more anonymous manner and protecting people's privacy. Whether or not that's good or bad, it, it, you know, we can we can evaluate, but it is a categorization with it, which in the, within the crypto asset uh, marketplace. Another area is financial services. I mentioned Ripple. Ripple right now is working with banks to to enact transactions in a much uh, <clears throat> faster manner. There are a number of assets that are doing that type of thing. So that's a whole nother category. And then there's other categories that are looking at things uh, that utilize the blockchain for storing data. There's a company that um, that I had been an original investor in um, called Factum. And Factum utilizes the blockchain to store uh, such things as uh, title insurance and records online onto the blockchain uh, that really, tra- that really, I think, revolutionize how people track data. So there's all these different types of applications that are out there within the crypto asset uh, area. So if people can educate themselves and take a look at these companies that are out there, one company that's rather interesting um, and is something called Filecoin, which uh, Filecoin already raised their money, but they took their money and then they went back and they're now creating the technology. I, I highlight them because... What they're going to do is kind of, is very interesting. They're going to basically allow people to use the addition, extra storage they have on their own computer and provide it out there almost as a cloud storage for the rest of the world. So you could be running your computer. You leave your computer on at night. You, <clears throat> you could get paid with a token, a Filecoin token. You get paid for somebody using your disk storage uh, as part of their overall storage. People would pay for that with with their own coin, and you would get paid with that. So you, it's a distributed manner to reward individual people. I mean, this is the t- type of technology that's out there. Whether or not that will succeed, I just think it's interesting that we're starting to see some real innovation being being utilized and looked at using these blockchain companies. Uh, so those are things to to take a look at. It's it's what are they? What are these assets doing? What business cases are they addressing? Uh, and I, like I said, I think it's very interesting. And there's there's new companies coming along just about every day in this space. You mentioned initial coin offerings. 
And I don't think there's a week that goes by I don't get an email or a phone right. call somebody asking me, how do I get involved in this? I have not gotten involved in any initial coin offerings. Can you explain to everybody what they are and your thoughts on them? If you, we're all pretty much familiar with an IPO. Okay. Uh, so you go and you raise money, uh, you sell shares of your company through an IPO. Uh, because we have the crowdfunding um, rate rules put into place, these companies are coming along with a business idea and they're saying as a way for me to fund my company rather than going through the lengthy process, uh, complex process of doing an IPO, I'm going to do something called an ICO, uh, initial coin offering. And basically I'm going to raise money from my business idea and I'm going to give people a coin in lieu of, let's say a stock. That coin should have utility value, uh, in line with its, um, with the application. Uh, people buy a coin, company takes the uh, money, they create their platform, the coin then chains on an exchange. That's why you have over, you have over a thousand different crypto assets. Uh, it's really as simple as that. Uh, typically at the early stages, people get discounts. We'll give you 50% more coins if you give us this amount of money. The, the problem is, uh, there's a need to really evaluate these companies because they're all being done online. Like you said, you get you get emails from these companies. So how do you evaluate these companies? And and the other side is the this isn't something that's gotten past the regulators. Regulators realize that there are million. I mean, we're we're seeing we're seeing hundreds of millions of dollars go into some of these ICOs, hundreds of millions of dollars in an unregulated manner. Uh, we may not be seeing a lot of IPOs coming out, but we're seeing a lot of ICOs because it's a lot easier to do. So regulators have stepped up and they've started to define what's a security and and really what's a what's something that uh, should be regulated by the SEC. Uh, and there's something called the Howey test that's out there. So there are all these things out there. Bottom line is that you can actually buy into some of these new companies through the ICO method. And I will tell you probably six months ago, if you picked any of these ICOs, you would have made money. I mean, they just were just on fire, doubling or whatever. The market has slowed down. There's been ICO fatigue. And even myself, who, you know, very much involved as an investor and I, and I work with a, a group of investors, we've kind of stepped away a little bit from the ICO market because uh, it's gotten overheated. And uh, there's not really a real benefit to getting into an ICO earlier than just seeing after the ICO comes to market how it performs. So an ICO is a great concept in terms of helping just about anybody to get involved in this space. So any type of investor six months ago could have invested in these ICOs, could have made an, a sizable amount of money. What's happened is we've seen more institutional money come in. We've seen more investment firms come in and they're starting to say, hey, you know what? You don't let's not offer this out there to everybody. We'll give you 10, 20, 30 million dollars. We'll take a boatload of these assets. And so now they're not getting out to the individual investors like they used to. And, and that's been one sign where we've seen institutional uh, investors and investment firms and hedge fund managers get into this space. And they're starting to really uh, dominate this space. And the, the large money is now pushing out the small money in this ICO area. Um, anyway, it's an interesting it's an interesting area to look at. I think we've had a little bit of ICO fatigue, but the thing I will tell you is there are some amazing, innovative companies that are growing out of this and are raising money through the ICO market that could potentially be the Amazons and the Facebooks of tomorrow. So it's it's a space that shouldn't be dismissed. It's a space that people should look at, but look at it in a very educated manner. And in fact, in the book, we talk about and we give a platform for how to evaluate these ICOs uh, when you look at them, because there are real ways that we've learned from taking a look at the ICOs that have come along uh, to how do you how do you identify one that's a valid company and potentially a profitable company? It's the beginning of 2018 and all of the talk is about the pricing of these crypto assets take us one year from now the beginning of 2019 how will the conversation change i think it's going to be around the uh, the creation of investment vehicles for the individual investor the typical investor you're going to i think the conversation will be uh around managers who are going to start to create 
mutual funds and investment vehicles around these these crypto assets and and people will start looking at these uh, and looking at the companies that are underlying this. So I would say that I think 2019 people will be less concerned about the price of Bitcoin and more concerned about what else is out there that can, I can invest in and that I can invest in easily. Uh, and I think you're going to see, like I say, mutual funds and portfolios for people to invest in. I also think the other thing, Anthony, that I think will be interesting to see, I think it'll be interesting to see if we, if we see any large companies start to acquire or partner with these crypto asset companies. We're already seeing Ripple is partnering up with a, a number of banks to do things. But I could potentially see different things happening. Like, for instance, you mentioned Coinbase. Coinbase not being one of the easiest things in the world to, to work with. Um, and we've got a company like Square or Overstock that are very much involved in crypto assets. Could there be some sort of partnership or or some sort of a way for, for those companies to start to work together. I think once you start to see that, then you're going to start to see more of, okay, well, who are the stocks and the equities that I can benefit with in this play as well? So it's not just crypto assets. It's what are the established companies that could potentially benefit by this? Because if we start to see a couple of acquisitions or a couple of partnerships in this space, it'll really get exciting. I couldn't agree with you more. The way I look at it right now, everyone's looking at the price of these crypto assets and the trading side of things. I think in a year from now, the business side of things starts getting implemented. Excellent insight today, Jack. Loved it, but we're not done yet. We have some rapid fire questions if you're ready for those. Anthony, hit, hit away there, my friend, hit away. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone, our rapid fire segment is sponsored by Trading Technologies. Trade the global markets from virtually anywhere with TT. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. Create your account and try it now free at tryttnow.com. First question, Jack, what trader has influenced your life the most and why? Uh, well, you know, obviously, you know, you look at a guy like Buffett and and Buffett has has definitely influenced me because uh, of his his evaluation that you should only invest in things that you know. So I, I've always paid attention to, you know, if I go into a Starbucks and I see a lot of people there or I don't see a lot of people there, uh, th then that's something to invest in. And and I try and use that type of tech, that type of thinking as well when I go to different conferences and talk to different uh, companies and different stocks. So I, I buff it, you know, it, it, granted, I don't agree with everything he says, but his whole approach to being able to invest in what you know, I think is a smart move. How has your trading and investing evolved over the years? Well, you know, I obviously, you know, I was very focused early on for just growth, 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 growth. Uh, now, as I get very close to investment, uh, I find myself uh, being being very much around asset allocation, taking profits uh, when I need to. So it, it's it's evolved o over time. And I think that it comes back to the goal that I have of of as I get closer to retirement and those types of things, which I think is something that every trader should should always remember. There's always going to be situations where, uh, you, you know, you, you 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 trade, take a profit, but you've got to always think about your underlying goals behind that. What's the number one resource you spend your time on? Probably in the crypto space, there's a site called uh, CryptoCompare.com. And uh, it's just a wealth of tech, technical analysis, fundamental analysis around all of these different crypto assets. And the guy's done an amazing job. If you're looking to evaluate crypto assets, CryptoCompare.com is, is a place to go. And I'm, I'm there a few times a day. What's your favorite book about trading or the markets? Well, I do. I do love The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. And in fact, when Chris and I wrote the book, we a little bit of a tip of tip of the hat by by calling our investors the innovative investors. And that's a tip of a hat to, to Mr. Graham. So I would go with that as well as uh, many of the writings of my good friend Harry Markowitz as well. What's your favorite movie or TV show about trading or the markets? It's a wonderful life. What's the best piece of advice you've received about trading or the markets? The 70-30 rule. Uh, with crypto assets, because you never know where they're going to go, uh, sell 70% of them 
and keep 30% of them and just hold on to them. Uh, I wish I had, I wish I had done that, uh, over the last couple of years, but that's something I'm doing now. If you can give a piece of advice to the new people interested in investing in crypto assets, what would it be? If you're looking to hit a home run, you're going to get, you're going to get hurt. You have to view this as a small percentage of your portfolio and invest in this, uh, with the thinking of, of your overall investment portfolio. It should not be a hundred percent of your assets. It should be a percentage that you're comfortable with, and it should be something that you rebalance on a regular basis. Last question, Jack, if you weren't involved with the markets, you'd be doing what? Well, since my career as a, uh, as a singer in a punk rock band didn't work out too well for me, uh, <laughs> I would probably be a, a college professor teaching English. Jack, this was awesome today. Uh, it, it was such a pleasure having you on the show. I've read your book. I listened to it on Audible. It, it is by far the most insight on crypto assets that I have come across. So I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Where can people follow you on Twitter and give us a website to check out? Sure, sure. Twitter is probably the best place to go. It's um, Jack Tater, T-A-T-A-R. Um, and you can follow my uh, co-author, Chris Berniski, who's he just put some amazing stuff uh, on Twitter as well. He's at C Berniski, C B U R N I S K E. And you can also go to a website that we created as a companion to the book, which is Bitcoin and beyond.com. Uh, we have a Twitter feeds there and we post some articles exclusively there. Uh, so that's probably the best way to just um, keep up with us. Uh, absolutely. Both of you guys are must follows on Twitter. Uh, I, I, when I came across your book, I immediately went and followed you guys on Twitter and it, it's just been really so informative, uh, helping us understand these crypto assets. Jack, thank you again so much for coming on futures radio show. And I look forward to speaking with you again in the future. Anthony, thank you very much. Thanks for the kind words about the book. And I appreciate everything you do. Thank you for listening to futures radio show. If you have any questions or comments for myself or my guests, please visit futuresradioshow.com and sign up to be a premium member for free. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes.